Hello, you're listening to the Sound on Sound People and Music Industry podcast with me, Sam Ingalls. In this series of episodes, I'm interviewing some of the people who are nominated at the 2023 MPG Awards. And this morning, I'm delighted to be joined by William Purton. Hello, Will. How are you doing? Hi, I'm really good. Glad to be here. Excellent. Well, it's lovely to meet you. You're nominated in the 2023 MPG Awards as Rising Star, yes. which I think is an award that goes to someone who's in the relatively early stages of their career. So tell us about how you got to be where you are at the moment. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm very, very honoured to be nominated, obviously. Like, I've actually been knocking around for a while now in the industry. Like, I, I studied at Lipper and graduated in 2013. So, And I've been in studios since then. I, I got a job in Motor Museum Studio with Al Groves up in Liverpool. And I spent a good like year and a half there like as the in-house engineer. Moved back down to London because that's where I'm from. Did a few years at Maloko. And then a friend put me in touch with the team at, at Rack. Um, and I moved there in about 2017. And I've been, yeah, worked my way up to in-house engineer over the last couple of years. Wow, so in some ways quite an old school career path, really. Yeah. Um, did you actually start out making tea? I actually did. Do you know what? I didn't even know how to make coffee when I started because I was a tea drinker. <laughs> and on my first session, I had to try and work it out. And over the course of like a week with these clients, you're like, is this okay? And they're like, mm, a bit stronger. Uh, mm, mm, a bit more. And then kind of by the Sunday, it was like, okay, that's a passable like, cup of coffee. So now like, you I can, can operate it. the tape machine. I just can't do the express. <laughs> I know machine. what a microphone is. I've got no <laughs> idea how to get caffeine in tea, though. Sorry. <laughs> Oh, that's a dangerous gap in your knowledge. I'm yeah. glad you were able to fill that. <laughs> oh, quickly. yeah, no, we've uh, we've moved on quickly. We've moved on quickly now. But I guess one key difference there is um, 30, 40 years ago, very few people would have gone to formal education to learn about careers in studios. Mm. How did being at Lipper help you? That's a really good question. I think it it helped a lot just in a lot of the technical grounding that you get and also just being able to go into a studio when the pressure's off and it's just you or some mates in your own time and just try things out without there being you know clients there who actually need to get something done by the end of today that's like of a good quality like really going in and trying out microphone techniques and getting under the hood of things that way was really helpful and also like although you do still learn a lot on the job when you're actually working in studios there are certain things which are kind of just expected now to to know from the get-go you're expected to be able to operate a door pretty well you're expected to be able to like make good microphone choices and like just understand a lot of the, the background of how digital recording works. And Lipper was all of that stuff and more. And you were able to go straight from Lipper to a job in a studio. I mean, they must have seen something pretty special in you because obviously those those kind of entry level roles in studios are hugely competitive. What do you think it was that made you stand out among your cohort? Do you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not really sure. I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm getting all British and embarrassed about this now. Um, I think there was a mix of people at Lip of, uh, who wanted to go into studios or people who wanted to produce their own music and there were people who wanted to do live sound and the course kind of caters for, for all of those. I was very much a studio head right from the start. This is 100% what I do. And I think maybe there were like four or five of us who were really, really aimed at that out of like a 30-person 30, 30 cohort. Um, and... I don't know. I guess I guess it was actually the course leader put me in touch with Al, who was moving into Motor Museum at the time. I guess I guess he must have just. I don't know. I really don't know. I just. I, I mean, I I just got really really lucky to be able to walk straight into a studio job, and just start recording bands and bringing people in on downtime and really getting stuck in and, you know, building your career. It's incredibly lucky these days. Yeah. Well, there is that saying that you make your own luck, mm. or the other saying that people like to use this you know the harder i work the luckier i get yeah and yeah. it does sound as though you've put the hours in definitely yeah <laughs> a lot of hours in studios over the years yeah I'm, I'm just really grateful to be honest i mean ob obviously you work hard because everybody else is working hard too and you just try and try and get your skills to a point where people see that for what it is i hope and and yeah you get the get a break get the chance you were hoping for a motor museum has an amazing reputation for developing new bands and local bands. Is that something you were involved with? Yes, I mean it was very much, very much, not grassroots, but like it was a it was a very local studio. Like you'd never get bands coming up from London to work. So if and if any bands in Liverpool would get big, they'd often get signed and then come down to London to to do like their second record or whatever kind of the stuff that might get really really big. So we were working with a lot of like younger bands trying things out 
which was good because it gives us a chance to experiment as well. You know, they're just having a good time being in the studio and like they're experimenting too with how much they can layer up certain guitars and things like that. And we're experimenting and, you know, all, all developing at the same time. On moving to London, did you notice a sort of significant difference in the way the studios are set up down there? Um, yes and no. I mean, to some extent, studios are just studios. There's always going to be microphones, there's always going to be a live room, there's mostly going to be a desk. But like the working attitudes in London, obviously, like the, the stakes are a bit higher. People are paying more money. Um, people here are often a bit more, you know, they've been around the block a little bit more and, you know, because they, they know exactly what to expect and they know when you're doing your job well and when you're not. So, yeah, the pressure was definitely on a little bit more. But that's just, that's just a reason to develop more, isn't it? That's the right kind of pressure to just really hone your own skills and, and get better and get quicker. And also, yeah. I think a big part of being in studios a lot is the personalities as well, isn't it? And that side of thing, I don't think really does get or can be taught really in an educational institution. That's one of the things you really do have to learn on the job. And moving to London, it was a lot less informal. It's a lot more, you know, people are still nice. People are have, having a good time because at the end of the day, we're making music. We're not, you know, Saturday in a bank, crunching numbers. But still people, yeah, expect good results and they expect them quickly. And yeah, moving to London was a big a big step up in my ability to do that, I think. And one of the distinctive things about Rack Studios in particular there is that there's quite a large team of mm. in-house, both engineering and non-engineering staff. How important is that and how much of a difference does that make to your work? Having a big staff? Well, I mean, one thing that's really nice about Rack, and I think this is partly because it is quite an old school studio, I mean, it's coming up to its 45th, 46th year kind of running now, is you have a lot more... Yes, there are more people on the staff, but that means there's usually more people assigned to a session. Whereas other studios, you'd often have, you know, if you were the the engineer, you'd have like one assistant and that would be it. Like at Rack, there'll be an assistant and a runner. So there's already, like, there's just a bit more redundancy. You know, if, if the assistant's really busy doing something for you, there's still somebody who can make tea for the band because they're having to hang around 10 minutes for you to set up a drum kit or something like that. So that's really good. Um, it just it just means everybody can work within their capacity a little bit more. There's there's more headroom to just like take on more difficult tasks. Everybody's always got some backup. And the team is really, really good. Like it's a proper family vibe. Everybody gets on really well. We spend obviously a lot of time together. Um, but yeah, it's just the mix of personalities that they put together there is, is really, really good. And it's just hopefully a nice place for the clients to come to as well as a nice place for us to, to work. And I guess back in the day, those kind of classic studios, your Abbey Roads, your Racks, um, and the equivalents on the other side of the Atlantic, they would have had their own individual ways of doing lots of things. There would have been a particular sound that they got mm. through their own techniques, which were probably even proprietary or not widely talked about. Does that still go on? Is there a, a Rack sound? Is there a Rack way of doing things? I think so. I mean, if there's a Rack way of doing things, I think it's it's almost more of a personality thing of like just being really friendly and like nothing is too big of a problem and just making the clients have as good a time as possible because that counts for for just as that's just as much a reason people might want to come back as the room sound absolutely amazing and the mic stock is off the chain which it also is so like having both those things i think is part of the rack experience um in terms of the rack sound like studio two is really known for its drum sound this really tight punchy i mean yeah i remember starting to work in big studios and putting up room mics i used to do this at lipper where the rooms were so dead and you'd be like these just, they don't sound like anything. Then you come to Rack and you put up a couple M50s and you're like, ah, okay, <laughs> that's the drum sound. Now I'm getting somewhere. So yeah, I mean, and there's the old API desks as well, which just sound amazing. Those are like by far my favorite desks to work on. They just, I don't know, saturate in a really, really nice way and the EQs are so powerful. It's really, really hard to get stuff sounding bad in there. It's just such a joy every day. The Studio One's my favorite though. That room is, there's something special about that, especially for strings. And you've got a new Atmos space as well. Have you had a chance to get involved with any Atmos mixes? Yes, yeah, I was actually in there yesterday. Um, I'm just in the final stages of going through the accreditation process. You have to get on a, you know, an approved mixer list. Um, but yes, yeah, I've been in there kind of like, you know, people I've been doing stereo mixes for just going like, oh, do you want to do an Atmos mix? Like, come on in and let's just have some fun and pan things around. And it's really, really interesting. I mean, Atmos is very exciting and it's good to see it catching on. It's always difficult to know, isn't it, with a new technology? It's like 3D in cinema, whether it's actually going to gain real traction and keep on and have some longevity when stereo has been around for, you know, 90-something years now and kind of just always stayed the course. But I, I think I think Atmos does have a chance. I think being able to play it on headphones, anybody, anywhere, really, really helps. And I think it does give you more. 
I think it, it doesn't have to be like this extra sticking plaster. Oh, hey, look, something's above you now. You know, experience like it. It really can be really immersive and really involving, and kind of more than some of its parts. So I think it's a really interesting toy. Not toy. It's a really interesting thing to be able to play around with as a as an engineer from a technical point of view. But I think also for the listeners, it's I don't know. There's potential for it to be like something really special. I think. So tell us a little bit about the projects that you've worked on during the nomination period. Yes. Well, I mean, the 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 really big one for me was I. Ended up engineering a lot of Liam Gallagher's most recent album, Come On You Know, which was recorded kind of in various stints over most of the course of 2021. And an engineer called Adam Noble, who I know really well, um, I used to assist him a lot kind of back in my assisting days. He had started off the project and they were doing a lot of it at Rack. Um, and they had extended for so long that Adam had to move on to a different project and he called me up and said, are you around because I just need somebody to step in? You know Liam because I'd assisted the previous album. You know, he knows you and he wants to know if you'll be up for kind of doing this thing. So yeah, yeah. And it went from being, you know, what was meant to be a week of recording into like a solid month <laughs> pretty much every single day, re-recording loads of the tracks and adding loads of bits in. And yeah, which was... A, a, a challenge and obviously you know that the stakes have never been higher but a really really fun experience and Liam's a great guy to hang around with and like all all his band are like super super cool and yeah just having everything available at rack all the equipment to like really get stuck into and after you know a few years of trying things out and getting to a point where you're ready to do that really having to having the chance to go for it with like a really big a-level project was was yeah Really, really special. And actually, encouragingly, not that different to doing anything for anybody else. Do you know what I mean? You're like, ah, oh, great. Okay, I've got this. You're not sure. You're like, is this in my wheelhouse? But no, it went really, really well. Yeah. So some, someone like that, when you get someone with like an absolutely iconic voice that yeah. comes into the studio, who's also made a lot of classic records that they're known for, yep. does he come with his, his vocal chain that he's like, this is what I do? Or do you get to kind of say, well, let's we could do this or we could do that? Do you know, actually kind of neither, because Liam is not very technically minded he really really just enjoys music and enjoys singing and he kind of just my my read of, of him as a client and trying to give him the best experience he could get in the studio is he just wants to come in and just have a good time and there'd be no technical hold-ups at all so like if you asked him what's your microphone he, he would he wouldn't know to tell you i knew from adam kind of what they'd used in previous recordings but he also doesn't want to spend much time trying things out he'll just want to i just want to sing and I think by the time you've been, you know, if you had the, the amount of success in the industry that he's had, you, you don't want to muck around waiting for someone to choose microphones. You just want to go. And so, yeah, you set up a couple of microphones, one set maybe just a little bit quiet because he sings quite loud, and one set where you think it's going to be and just hope <laughs> hope that the main mic doesn't go over. But, yeah, so, like, you know, yeah, we had by the end we had a whole chain in mind, and it's like you set it all up. You got all the recalls, and just Liam, all he has to do is just turn up and and just do his thing into the mic. So, what did you settle on in the end? Uh, well, you know, when you got the expensive expensive kit there, it's very hard not to use it. So his his mic is there's one specific Neumann forty seven at Rack, which sounded really really good on him. So we used that. We actually did some sessions at Air, and Rack let us take that one mic with us, um, just because it. I mean, they're they're old. They all sound a little bit different. That one really, really sang with them. And then we had an SM7 up as well, just as a just in case. And you know, some songs you just want that like slightly smaller, tighter sound anyway. So we kind of like kept our options open again because Liam just wants to come in. His his thing is just singing, and like you don't want to get in the way or spoil his mood because he's a he's a lovely guy. But like you know, you don't want to get in his way when he's it's he's the artist. It's his project. So yeah, we would take both, and then in the mix, kind of choose which everyone was feeling best for the song and did you track through compression and eq as well yes yeah a little bit i mean so it would be the, the main, main vocal chain would be a 47 a vintage 1073 pre into an 1176 uh, blackface and then actually not that much eq on the way in you know we'd be doing quite a lot of processing on his channel as he was singing to get the you know to, to get it as vibey and finished sounding as we could um, so yeah, a little, little bit of EQ in the box. I mean, sometimes a bit of distortion or saturation and so a bit of slap back and things like that. And that would be enough for him to kind of get in the zone and just be able to do his thing. Yeah. Cause I think there was a time when people thought that the need to process on the way in was kind of something that was not really necessary anymore once we'd moved on from mm. tape. But actually when you're working fast on a session, you want to give the musicians the best possible experience. You do have to be willing to 
to really jump in on that stuff. Yeah, I think you do. And I think, I mean, for me, I want to capture as much of the, the sound as possible at source. But I, I am in a very fortunate position where at somewhere like Rack or any of the major studios, you, you have loads of great equipment to be able to do that. Um, and great monitoring to be able to make confident decisions. So you can go like, great, I want an 1176 on this, I want an LA2 on that, I want a C12, I want a this, I want my overheads to be blah, and I want to EQ it all, and I want to basically just treat Pro Tools as a tape machine, and when I play it back, it already sounds halfway there. And when you come to mix it then, also, your job's that much easier, because it's not just the sound, but also the vibe. Like, people performed reacting to that sound, like you say, and that's so much of a... So you can amplify their performance or help them do their best and just kind of live in a really really good vibe and just grab it and then after that it's so much easier like rather than having everything recorded really clean and having to basically like construct a whole mood a whole character for a mix post like maybe like weeks or months later it kind of it's always just that much of an uphill struggle but i mean if you don't have the equipment available to do that there's absolutely nothing wrong with just recording things just just clean just getting a really really good well recorded signal and then you can these days do a lot in the box to really really get things sounding good but yeah given the luxury of choice record on the way in with all the processing is definitely my my choice and this is one of those areas where engineering sort of straddles the boundaries between being a technical discipline and a creative discipline mm. I, I mean do you see yourself located both sides of that or one side in particular no i i, I hopefully straight down the middle because you're exactly right like as soon as you choose a microphone because it not because it sounds a certain way, because it gives a certain feeling, right? That's almost like a production decision. And it's certainly like, it's maybe not something every listener would go like, oh, do you know what? That kick drum really makes me feel oh, so warm. It's so great. It really puts this in my mind. But those things are happening subconsciously. Even if people can't point to it, you've still helped the listener have a certain experience of the music. And you're kind of trying to match, read between the lines of what the band really want people to feel as much as how they want the song to sound. And yeah. And it, it does all come down to technical stuff, and that's where somewhere like Lipper and having a te like an academic grounding in the technical side of things really, really helps, because that's kind of just ticking away in the back of your mind, okay, this a dynamic mic would really suit this because blah, 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 blah. No, this wants to be a condenser, it wants to be this far away from someone for these reasons, and it's all about the end product feeling as good to the listener as you can get it. And I suppose in the long run, that's that then shades into actual production and making more high-level choices about music. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like I say, I think as soon as you're making a technical decision for a musical reason, then it's kind of like there's there's an element of creativity coming into the, the, the what can be a purely technical role of engineering already there. And I think for a lot of people, that's that's a, a natural kind of step up. And that's something I, I would like to go to, definitely. Being able to like record things really well, get the technical side of things to a point where it's, it's kind of just muscle memory enough that you can then focus on how this is affecting the music and really encourage artists in that way. And when I get to do that on sessions, that's like, that. those are the, like, the, the gold standard days at the office. Do you know what I mean? Everything's coming together, the technical stuff and the musical stuff. Because I'm, I'm, I'm an erstwhile piano and bass player, very, very, very bad. Um, <laughs> every, every engineer is a failed musician. But it's nice when you can bring some of that musical experience and things too and kind of like edge into a bit more of a production role. Yeah, amazing. Well, that certainly sounds like an incredible project to have worked on. Um, is there anything else you've been doing more recently that we should listen out for? Um, well, I've been doing a few records with Shabaka Hutchings, and it's in a bit of a different musical world. Like he, he's a jazz, uh, UK-based jazz saxophonist for anyone who doesn't know him. But he started up a label which is based at, at Rack called Native Rebel Recordings, and we maybe every six months he'll find an artist, put together a scratch band. And it's very jazz, do you know what I mean? It's very like Miles Davis. No one really knows what is going to happen. You'll just turn up with your instruments. <laughs> and then Shabaka has some master plan in mind. Um, and we basically just record th these long form jams, which then kind of edited down into like, you know, four to seven minute pieces after the fact. But it's 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 what I love most about engineering. It's It's everything is live instruments. The whole thing is musicians interacting together you're in an incredible sounding room with incredible sound of equipment and once you get it all you know you're balancing spill versus like having things tight on the mics and just trying to get everything really tasteful and working together and then you just let them do their thing and um yeah so we had there's a record by chelsea carmichael 
Um, he's also a saxophonist, which is doing really well on the jazz scene, and um, a record by a, an artist called Con and Quake, which is a, an MC and a drummer, um, which we worked on together, both in Rack Studio too. Um, I'm really proud of those. So yeah, people should check out those records. They're really, really interesting. Different vibe to the Liam thing for sure, but you know, nice to get your jazz chops out every once in a while. Well, yeah, and just great to be able to work on such a huge variety of stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. Every day is different, which is one of the things I really, really love. Yeah, it's never too samey. Every every day is a different challenge. Awesome. Well, I'm glad that today has involved recording a podcast for Sound on Sound. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you ever so much for your time, Well, It's been wonderful <laughs> to meet you. And uh, be- My pleasure. Best of luck at the awards. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. And be sure to check out the show notes page for this episode, where you'll find further information along with web links and details of all the other episodes. Oh, and just before you go, let me point you to the soundonsound.com forward slash podcasts website page, where you can explore what's playing on our other channels. (laughs) 